It's absolutely fantastic to be here in Stockholm. I'm currently living in Gothenburg. I've been working with Volvo Cars for the last three years. Uh, much of what we're going to talk about today is stuff that we've done with Volvo Cars over that time. Um, I've not spent a huge amount of time in Stockholm, uh, although I did this year uh, for the first time come through with my family. That's actually in the middle there, my, my littlest daughter. She's a uh, one-year-old, Erika. Uh, she was born here in Sweden, so she's got a Swedish name. But unfortunately, um, she took an allergic reaction while we were here. Um, <laughs> so this was her last trip. That said, my elder daughter thought this was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is it's about leadership. And for many of us in the room, I'm sure, we've built our careers up over many decades, certainly many, many years. Uh, but many of the management practices that we've built our careers upon have to change now because economic efficiency is no longer the primary thing that we need to focus on. It's all about responsiveness. How can we become much more responsive? And how can we find ways of finding out where the constraints are within our organization? But I think it's fair to say that for everyone in this room, especially for me, technology has played uh, an important part in our lives. So I thought it would only be fair to start with some personal stories. So this was me, Christmas Day, age 10. And this was my, my very first computer, a Commodore 64. Um, BASIC was my first language. I was never into computer games. I played Paperboy, but that, that was about the extent of it. And my parents, they never really understood why I wanted a computer. And obviously, it's, it's become a huge part of my life now, so it's been quite important. But I used to terrify my parents because you used to get an illegal exception that you could get back from BASIC. So I, I would type in bank details, and then I'd horrify them because they think I was poking around at the, the edges of banking infrastructure. You skip past a few years. And these types of telephones, they were a common issue in the UK. Uh, I, I was brought up in Scotland. And British Telecom used to give these free of charge with your phone lines. But this was back in the days long before mobile phones. So people weren't able to simply connect at any point. They had to arrange in advance that you're going to phone and you'd have to get, you know, be waiting by the telephone in the house. Um, and then my parents could never quite understand why the phone calls never came. My computer habit had turned into an internet habit, and I was consuming a phone line upstairs. So many, many years they waited by. At this point, I probably was trying to get access to, uh, access to banking infrastructure. Age 24, uh, show of hands, does anybody's on-site look like this just now? Thank goodness, I'm really pleased to see that. <laughs> but, but this is what things looked like when I finally became a programmer. And you had to plan in advance really a huge amount of things. You had to anticipate a huge amount of things about how people were going to interact with your software. Um, I, I have to openly admit, it wouldn't be the first time that I've accidentally flicked the wrong button or pulled the wrong cable. Um, so this is quite terrifying. But then you skip forward to today, and I'm not going to give away my age, certainly a lot older than, uh, than the previous slide, but things have changed a lot. So there's Erica now, not having an allergic reaction, but certainly playing with a mobile phone. And of course, there's tablets. And even Grandad's getting in on the action with his e-reader. Somewhere tucked behind him, Alexa's sitting listening, just waiting on cue to do something. Sonos, even our music and our television, is coming through speakers that are hooked up to the internet and ultimately running on software. And of course, all those different dial-up systems, they're, they're not relevant any longer because it's broadband. We, everything's coming over uh, Wi-Fi the whole time. So this is a very, very different world to what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And ultimately now, software is eating the world. It's accelerating faster and faster. And with that, all of our management practices and leadership practices, they also have to keep pace. They also have to change. But the, the problem that we have is, how do we look at our organizations and start to understand what are the constraints, what are the things that are holding us back? Because I think especially at conferences like this, we're, we're quite good at identifying new practices that we should adopt. But how do we know which ones we should stop doing? That's significantly harder. At an individual level, it's difficult to unlearn, but at an organizational level, when you've got all this organizational architecture and infrastructure around you, it becomes ever more difficult to take that step. 
Now, one of the things that makes that very difficult is called weak signals. And these essentially are tiny little fragments of information that are available and they can be seen. And I'm sure you're all seeing them in your organizations. But due to your experience, you're wrongly interpreting those things. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. So back in 1941, on the 7th of December, the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service attacked the US naval base at Pearl Harbor. The attack began just before eight o'clock in the morning and it continued to run for seven hours, a complete bombardment. Now, over that time, around 2,433 American personnel lost their lives. And a further 1,178 were critically wounded. The Japanese uh, impact was significantly less. They lost 64 people. Now, it's well believed that this was a significant event and it hit the American public extremely hard. And it's believed that this is one of the things that caused America to finally join the efforts of World War II and support the Allied forces. But perhaps what's not quite so well known is this is a fantastic example of weak signals. There was a huge amount of information available to the leaders on the ground at Pearl Harbor that they weren't able to take advantage of due to their experience and the wrong in interpretation of that information. So for example, ahead of the, ahead of the attack, um, the Tokyo had contacted uh, the US and told them to destroy all ciphers and all equipment. Uh, again, I believe in the morning of the attack, a, a Japanese midget submarine was sunk right at the mouth of Pearl Harbor. And then within the hour in the lead up to the attack, there was a massive number of inbound, uh, inbound aircraft discovered on radar, but nobody was able to pick up on that information. And Dave spoke this morning about retrospective coherence. If we were to look at all the different pieces of information, that's only a snapshot of them, it would be very difficult to understand why anyone had misinterpreted those events and hadn't prepared themselves. But it's not so easy to anticipate. Slightly different to that is inattentional blindness. And again, Dave called on this one this morning. We're really not very good at multitasking. And we only see the things that we expect to see. And that's why catastrophes like this also happen. And this happens in our enterprises. We can be paying attention to things like annual budgeting cycles or status reports, and we're actually missing the really important details, the real information, the real cues that we should be looking at if our experience told us to look at those things so that we could understand how to remove the constraints that we really have in the organization. So the approach I'm going to talk about today, as I said, we did this with Volvo cars over the last year, and it's been incredibly successful. And it's really quite simple on many, many, uh, many different levels, but to Colin Rosa Luxemburg, those who don't move don't notice their chains. So what we want to do here, the approach that we've taken is to create a small team that are exceptionally fast moving, and then we use that as a vehicle to see what constraints within the organization are they going to butt up against? So that's going to give us really good insight into the things that we're struggling with that need to be removed. The things that the people within your organization have simply learned to work with over a long period of time. So we've called this um, approach the product experimentation team. Now, I would call out, I, I spoke about this in Athens a few weeks ago, and someone said, but you can't have a cool team doing the experimentation stuff on the side. And that's not what this is about. Ultimately, experimentation, we want to become part of all of our team's way of working. This is not only experimentation in terms of the products that they're building, but also in terms of how they're able to deliver these products within the organizational environment. So this is Marfat. She's one of the tech leads in the team. Uh, she's going to introduce it from the team's perspective and what they do. So to me, the pet team is um, kind of 
getting together with a bunch of project managers, uh, product owners, designers and developers and then pick a hypo hypothesis uh, and then experiment on that, meaning we look at what users uh, would like to kind of get from a journey and then testing that, uh, developing that and then executing it in a manner that will actually be effective. So at this point, you're probably thinking there's nothing significantly different to what we do with our own teams in our own organizations. However, where it starts to become different is when you start to look at how can we use this as a tool for our organization, and then I'll come on to say what's different about the, the remit and the scope that we give to the team. So first of all, the approach that we're going to talk about, it allows you to see your organization through fresh eyes. Now, it's always difficult if I said to you, just pay attention to the, the, um, all the, the weak signals that are out there and you know, think about inattentional blindness. With the best of intention, you're not going to be able to do that. Your experience is going to override those natural human instincts and biases. So what we're going to do is use this team, the product experimentation team, essentially to become a team of sensors that are able to give you the information that you need as a manager or a leader to take action and amplify positive things across the organization. So it's a way to discover organizational constraints through doing. So the key thing here is this isn't sitting in an ivory tower planning out how you're going to change. This is about building products and building services and understanding what constraints do you hit when you start to go faster in doing that. It's about crowdsourcing intelligence on how to nurture change. And I love Dave's point this morning on nurturing change, not designing change. This gives you a mechanism to be able to understand what do the people who have to work in your organization, what do they need from you in order to be performant? And it's also about exploring new approaches at low risk and low cost. So I think back to the, the economic effectiveness uh, point, for many, many years, we've, we've become accustomed to the fact that change can be expensive, whether it's technology change or process change or any kind of change tends to be expensive. This provides you a really fast mechanism to be able to try things out and see how do they affect your organization? Are they positive? Are they negative? Do we want to amplify them or do we want to dampen them? And finally, it's a way of shortcutting that endless top-down planning and debate cycle. I've sat in many meetings for many years where, where people have been discussing what it is that they need to do within the organization and coming up with year-long plans and Gantt charts. Ultimately, in a, in a world of complexity, you can't plan out because you could do one thing today and do the same thing tomorrow and get an entirely different effect because it's non-deterministic. So, again, back to Dave's talk from this morning. He, he started to talk about Kinefin towards the end. One of the key things here is product development, you know, as we spoke about this morning, sits somewhere, floats back and forward between complex and complicated. The key thing to think about with the pet team, though, is organizational change, organizations being human systems, is always in the complex domain. Because people have intelligence, they've got intent, uh, they've got different ideas about what they want to do. So you never know how somebody is going to respond to something today versus how they'll respond to that thing tomorrow. So we're always operating in the complex environment when we're looking at organizational change. So what does that mean when it comes to constraints? We've spoken about the difference between governing constraints that you use in a complicated domain and then enabling constraints that you would use in complex. Well, in the old world, in the, in the governing world, we would say to the team, we want you to build this exact thing and we want you to build it in this exact way with these exact technologies and reporting to these structures and everything would be laid out very, very clearly and people would be expected to adhere to that perfectly. It's really different with the pet team. So we remove all of those governing constraints. And what we say is we're putting some enabling constraints in. So we now give them the problem to solve. We say we want you to achieve this particular outcome for the customer or for the business. However, there's some things that we simply do not want you to do. These are the no-go areas. Now, the key thing about those no-go areas is anything else is completely within their opportunity to try and experiment with. So we're not mandating technology systems. We're not mandating certain structures or boards that they have to report with. What we're saying is there are some things you mustn't do. After that, you can do whatever you want. So for example, one enabling constraint that we put in place with the pet team is to say, never go more than five days without getting customer feedback on the thing that you're building. That includes week one. 
So suddenly they have to start thinking really differently about how can they put things in front of customers to get feedback from the very, very beginning and maintain that on an ongoing basis. Don't take longer than six weeks to release your product or essentially be complete with your product. Now by that I don't mean that's the first time they go to production. What I mean is after six weeks, that's done. Okay, so they're having to move exceptionally fast and they're having to really challenge some of the organizational constraints that are in place to move at this kind of pace. Never deploy anything to the production environment without knowing how you're going to measure impact. You absolutely must know how you're going to measure impact. And then the final point is never deploy less than once per day. So those become the enabling constraints. After that, we're not going to mandate anything on the teams. They've got complete reign to try and explore whatever they want. So here's Cecily, who's the delivery lead, to tell us a little bit more about that six-week um, deadline. How is it possible to deliver a new product in six weeks? We, we have all the skills that we need within the team, um, and the team has autonomy to make the decisions that they need to make. Um, and we have access to customers, we have access to markets, um, so in that sense, we have all the tools that we need in order to deliver. Um, so it's just about how quickly the team can um, produce something. I love how nonchalant she is about this. It, the key thing here is the skills to do this kind of thing sit within your organization. Usually it's the constraints that we put some people within the organization that makes things difficult. So what does that six weeks actually look like? Well, it's pretty crazy. It's something like this. So it starts out not knowing exactly what it is we're going to build. It's some kind of business challenge or customer challenge. And then quite quickly we move on to prototyping. So halfway through the first week we have a high fidelity prototype that then goes out in front of users by the end of week one. By week two we already have customer feedback so we're starting to iterate. By the end of week two we're already in production. This is now going out in front of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. By the beginning of week three, we've got analytics that have come back from that production environment. So again, at this point, usually the team's freaking out and deciding to go with a different version that they prototyped the first time round. Then they're A-B testing with that, and then they're iterating, and they're iterating, and they're iterating. The point is, by the end of that six weeks, they've got insight. They may have built a product, but they've got insight on what works for customers and what they had to change within the business. The biggest learning I made both personally and professionally is actually that by being able to act in an autonomous way you can behave differently, you can take the opportunity to actually take decisions when you need to take decisions and you don't, you can be more brave, you can actually be secure in your way of being brave, that you know that if you fail it's just that you learn from that and you, you do it better next time. So how do the team actually do that? Well, again, this comes back to some of Dave's language. So Dave often talks about attractors. And you might remember the phrase that we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors within boundaries. Well, an attractor essentially is some kind of social construct, whether it's people who uh, people listen to or whether it's different dynamics within your organization. But this attracts people towards that. And these are the things that often makes change difficult within your organization. What the team are going to do is start to experiment with different things that they have within their control. So essentially, they're looking to create new attractors. So it might be, for example, that at the start of the six-week iteration, they needed to get access to analytics data, but that system or those people sit in a different department. Well, they could be experimenting to see, could we actually get access to those platforms ourselves? Could we actually set up our own platforms that could do this? Or could we actually get someone from a different department to come and join us for that period of time? At some point, you're going to have created a new area of attraction. And at that point, new capabilities are available to you in the organization. So you have nudged the organization that little bit, taken an experimental approach to how you change the organization. And then we do it again. So ultimately, that crazy process that we looked at, in order for them to work within those enabling constraints, they have to be able to experiment at all different stages throughout that six weeks. And that control to experiment and essentially break rules with leadership mandate sits entirely with the team. 
So, just in conclusion. I think it's opened people's eyes as to what's achievable um, and maybe um, encouraged maybe out of the box type of thinking. So certain challenges we've had around processes um, at first, you know, they've seemed quite like big um, things that we're asking for, but um, maybe we've managed to show that actually loosening up the process in certain places doesn't necessarily mean that everything's gonna, I don't know, fall over and all of that sort of stuff. I would definitely recommend for people to join the pet team. I think it's an amazing experiment uh, and experience on top of that as well, uh, because it's a way of actually being able to be, again, involved in the whole kind of um, the making of a product, whether it's a journey or a standalone project. Uh, the most fun thing is probably just um, the team spirit. Um, we've definitely sort of fostered a really collaborative um, feeling within the team and, and everyone's supportive of one another, so that's been really good. M what has been most fun for me? Everything. It's fun to go to work every day. I love that quote from Will at the end. Thank you. <laughs>